If you will, turn in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, as we continue our study through the Word. So as we've been studying through now in the book of Revelation, by way of reminder, chapter 1, you'll remember that John's on the island of Patmos, and he has a visitation from the Lord, and, and he records that description of the revelation of Christ uh, that is given to us. And, and then you remember that the Lord is writing seven letters to seven churches. And so we are looking and working our way through those seven letters. We have covered three of them. We are on now our fourth church. Now, you'll remember that also each of these churches were an actual physical congregation located in cities that were in operation at the time. And, and so there are specifics that are written to those locations. But in addition to the specifics written to those who lived back then, we see that each of those churches have lessons for us today. We have the lessons that they were teaching to those people. We'll examine those. Uh, but also we see that they also, the church represents typologies. And so each of the church have a typology. So we'll be looking at that typology. And then also you'll remember that each of the churches represents a slice of church history in order beginning from the first day of, uh, of the church, the birth of the church, continuing all the way to the present time and into the future. And, and so looking at that first church, the first church was Ephesus. And you remember that that was a typology. It was a solid church. It was a good church. But there was one thing the Lord had against it and that they had left their first love. They, they had become very busy. They were a bustling, thriving church, but their passion for the intimacy with Christ had kind of diminished. And so the Lord calls them now back into a, a passionate renewal uh, of their relationship with him. It's known as the, the loveless church. And so we want to be careful not to become so busy doing that we forget the devotion of the Lord. It was the first section, the first slice of church history. And that was known as the apostolic age. Whenever you hear apostolic, it means the days of the apostles. It began on the day of Pentecost. That was the church's birthday. When the Holy Spirit comes down, Peter is preaching and 3,000 people get saved and, and the church age is really born then. It continues through underneath the leadership of the apostles. Those were the men that traveled with Jesus, lived with Jesus. They were a part of his ministry. And when the last apostle dies, the authority of the office of the apostle dies also with them. And now no longer do they have anybody that actually lived and walked with Jesus and was a part of his ministry to be able to resolve conflict or clarification on what Jesus was talking. John is the last of the apostles and, and he dies about the year 100 AD. And that ends now with his death, that ends the first uh, section uh, of church history was the time of the apostles. Year 100 to about the year 313 is the second slice. It's the second church that the letter is written to, and that was to Smyrna. And after the apostolic age, uh, we see the age of persecution. This was the time now when the uh, Roman Empire outlawed Christianity, where it was against the law to worship Jesus Christ, where if you did worship in Christ, you were put to death just for your belief in Jesus Christ. The, all of the problems of the Roman Empire were blamed on Christians, and so the Christians needed to be eradicated, and over five million people were put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. This was the time when Christians were hiding in the Roman catacombs and, and were living always in fear. It was the time of the persecuted church, and, and you'll remember that 
that the exhortation of the Lord was just hold fast to your faith. There was no rebuke. It, it was a time of purity of the church. It, it was now purified by persecution. And, and then all of that changed immediately in 313 AD when Constantine becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire and instantly he creates the Edict of Tolerance which meant that Christianity was no longer outlawed. And suddenly Christianity went from this persecuted church to now it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so it went from persecuted status to favored status. And suddenly now it had the government's backing and the government's support. And we see that there is now this mixture of power that enters into the church, whereas before they had no power whatsoever. They were just trying to stay alive. Now they became the new kid on the block that was the golden child. And, and with that, we see the influence of that power. With that power, we know that the power corrupts. And, and the first step of corruption is compromise. And we see the first cracks uh, enter in after the persecuted church comes in in the compromise. That was the church at Pergamos. And, and you remember that the Lord's exhortation was repent. You're starting to head the wrong way now whenever we head into compromise and we are headed in the wrong direction. We come to the fourth church now. And this fourth church age begins at the end of compromise and begins the period of corruption. When compromise enters in and is left unchecked, then compromise will ultimately lead to corruption. And so the period of time now that we are in, the period of corruption was the time of Constantine 313 to about the year 500. And then from the period of 500 to the period of 1500, this is now where we are going to see the church of Thyatira. It represents the corruption now that has entered into this favored religion that has become very powerful now all of the sudden. And so the church of Thyra, Tyra, let's begin here as we see what the Lord says to this church, typologically represented by the church of corruption, the corrupt church and spanning a thousand years in history, from 500 to 1500. So, verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So, Thyatira, let's talk about the city itself. First of all, the first previous three cities, Ephesus uh, and Smyrna and Pergamos, these were major cities. These were cities that had big temples. They were uh, successful commercially. They had great industry going on. And people would come and visit these. These were destination locations where you would come to see the great temples that they had and to sightsee and to tour and to vacation at Thyatira. Not so much. <laughs> Thyatira was the least important of all the seven cities that are going to receive letters. It was the blue collar city uh, of its day. It was a city that was filled with blue collar workers, with craftsmen, with in particular unions, trade unions, known as guilds uh, back then. All the different craftsmen had their own unions that they were involved uh, in. Now, Thyatira, the first mention that we see of, or in the New Testament, we see Paul visits Thyatira and he is preaching the gospel there. And you'll remember that Lydia, who was a, a purveyor of purple. Now, purple, the textile industry, the dyeing of the textiles and all, this was one of the, the crafts that, uh, that Thyatira was known for and one of the guilds. And so she invites uh, Paul to come to her house and to and stay there and to lodge there. And we see the gospel being preached there and taking root. This now is the church that's located in Thyatira. And so those guilds uh, played a major influence on what was happening 
within uh, that church itself. That was the cultural environment in, in which this church sprung up. Now, remember that in the vision of the revelation of Christ to John on Patmos, we have this description that's given. And then to each church, a slice uh, of that revelation that is appropriate to what's going on in that church. Uh, Jesus identifies himself as he writes to that church. So this is the corrupt church. And it is interesting the way that the Lord uh, presents himself to this church. It says, first of all, that he's the son of God. And, and then it goes on to say that his eyes are like flames of fire and that his feet are like burnished brass. Now, what's interesting about that is if you look back to chapter one, where the revelation is giving, Jesus is referred to as the son of man there. And now suddenly here as he's writing to Thyatira, he's not the son of man, he's the son of God. So why the change? What, what does that change mean? Well, remember that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And he is the son of man. When he is the son of man, he's identifying with mankind. We have got a, a representative. He stands as our high priest before God who understands us and always was tempted like us. And so he, he represents uh, us before God. Son of man is, is talking about his identification uh, with us as sinners. Son of God is when he is now... Uh, reflecting the nature of God, and he is representing God before us. And so what we see here is, is he is coming to this corrupt church, not to identify with it, but he's coming with power and authority to judge uh, this uh, city now, this church that uh, is no longer walking in its statutes and in his ways. And so we see the change from son of man to son of God. It says that his eyes are like flames of fire. Once again, that means judgment, the flames of fire, the fires of judgment. And his feet are like burnished brass. That's interesting also and indicative of uh, his message to this church. The metal brass, when you see it in scripture as a typology, sometimes brass just means brass. But if there is a typology that is involved, brass will always mean the place where sin is judged. We see that in the temple that there are the sacrifices that were made on the altar and they were burnt on the altar before God. That altar was the brazen altar. It was the brass altar. It's the place where the sacrifice is judged now before God. You remember that Moses in the wilderness, when the fiery serpents were sent in and, uh, as a judgment against the people uh, and would bite them, that, that Moses was instructed to take and to furnish a brass serpent, put it onto a wooden pole, and to stick, lift that pole up uh, within the congregation. Uh, and anybody who was judged uh, by a bite from the serpent, if they would look upon that pole in faith, then they would not die. Then, then the consequence of their conduct uh, was forgiven them. Brass means the judgment of sin. It was a typology of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would take our sin upon himself and, and then he would be lifted up upon a cross, upon a wooden pole, and, and whoever would look upon Christ in faith would be forgiven of their sins. And so it was a typology. It's the cross where sin was judged. So when Jesus' feet are brass, it's talking about the judgment of sin. So he has come now as the son of God with flames of fire to deal with the sin and judgment of the sin. So we see that to the corrupt church, uh, he is coming now in this fashion. It says in verse 19 that Jesus opens his mouth to speak. And he says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. He begins by saying, I know your works. I find that to be significant. To me, in it, what I see is represented is that Thyatira is the least of all of the cities. It is the insignificant city, if you will. And what God is saying, I believe, through that, 
is whether you are the most important and the most influential person on the face of the planet or whether you are uh, the least invisible, feeling unimportant as if you don't matter and you have nothing to offer anybody. No matter where you are in this spectrum, God sees you. I see you. I see you. He cares for you. There are times that we can feel, why would God even care about me? And yet, he absolutely does. He's madly in love with you, even if you're a Thyatira. (laughs) God still loves you. I know your works. I see you. It is amazing to me that God loves me. He is holy, holy, holy. The seraphim and the cherubim are flying around. He is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory, and yet he loves me. He loves me with such an intimacy that I cannot fathom and truly understand. He knows my my lying downs and my risings uh, ups. He knows exactly what time I went to bed last night. (laughs) He knows how long it took me from the time I laid down to the time that I drifted off to sleep. And he can tell you the moment that my eyes fluttered open uh, this morning. That type of intimacy, that type of love, that type of care is is beyond me. And not just to the important people of the world, to the Thyatiras, to every single person. I know your works, he says. I care for you. I'm so thankful that God is not a respecter of persons. That, that that type of care and intimacy is something that you have to qualify for, but that it is freely given because love is always freely given. It is never conditional. It is never performance-based. In the nature of God, God is love. You are loved today. You are loved. God is crazy in love with you. And the enemy wants to constantly tell you what a disappointment you are to God and and to point out every single one of your failures. And and it's like trying to talk to a, a proud parent about their child's failures. And it's like, yeah, he's all that, but did you see the picture on my refrigerator that he drew for me? I just love him. He's amazing. She's amazing. And, and that's the way God feels about you. I wonder if he has a giant refrigerator in heaven. <laughs> There's banquets. I wonder, does the food need refrigeration up there? And, and don't be surprised if your picture is all over his refrigerator in heaven. Know this. If you hear nothing else today, no matter where you are, God loves you today. Whether you are killing it and you have been worshiping the Lord with all your heart and you are on top of your spiritual game, or whether you crawled in here ashamed of yourself and and disappointed with the decisions that you've been making and feeling as distanced from God as you have ever felt in your entire life, God loves you exactly the same. He's glad to see you today. He's glad that you came to his house. He's glad that you showed up this morning. He loves the Thyatiras uh, of the world. And so I know your works. And it's a good church. There's some good things that are going on in in the church. He says that that your love, your service, faith, and and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than, than the first. It's a loving church. It's a loving church. Now, you'll remember that Ephesus was a church that was very busy, but it kind of lost its love. Here's a church that was very busy, and, and they still were known for their reputation for love. And, and he says, and this is a church of servants. This is a church of servants. This is a place where everybody was serving and working together. It was that blue-collar mentality, I think, of, uh, of coming together and not being afraid of, uh, of hard work, of rolling up your sleeves and let's get it done for the kingdom of, uh, of God. And, and they were doing great things because of, of that. And, and I think how important servanthood is 
within the body of Christ. I, I think today a criticism of some churches is that Christianity has sometimes become more of a consumer product uh, uh, amongst Christians than really a community, a family. And, and when you're a family, family has chores. We've got chores in our house and, and everybody participates in the in chores of the house. We're all partakers of the house. We all are living together. We all get to share in the enjoyment of it, but also in the, in the servanthood together of maintaining it and taking care of it. And, and within a church body, we're family. Uh, and so uh, uh, servanthood is so important. I think there are some churches today where the only servants you see are the paid staff. <laughs> And they're expected to take and to prepare. And the body comes in and consumes their their Christian service. And then they depart once again, leaving it to to those whose responsibility it is to, uh, to maintain and to take care of the, of the church. The church, is the life body of the church is the community. And when you have great servanthood within a church, then the light that you are able to cast within the community, the impact in people's hearts and lives is greater when we are all working together to be able to minister to one another and also to our community. Throughout the years here at our church, we have many ministries that come in that travel around and do their ministries throughout. And over and over again, one of the reputations for this church was for the servanthood of this church, the amount of servants uh, that we have within this church. And I want to continue to encourage everybody into servanthood, into servanthood. Christianity is not a consumer product. You are to bring in your gift uh, and to work together to serve together that we may have a greater impact uh, on one another and also on our community as well. And so he says, as for your service, your faith, they had held the faith. They were patient, he says, and you're not lacking in works. Your works, you're doing more things. I think the reason they're doing more things is because of their servanthood, because they had a church where the people were working alongside uh, of one another. He says they're, they're greater than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. He says, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to, to idols. We see that even though there are great things that are going on within the church, that the Lord is not blind to the things that are not correct. And that is true also in our life. While, while he would be the first to be able to encourage us in the things that we are doing right, also we need to have a teachable spirit to receive any area in our life that, that needs a tweak, that needs a correction. And so love doesn't mean just looking at the, the good things of a person. Love sees the whole entire person. God loves us. He sees the entirety of us. He's not just blinded by the, the good parts of us, but he's interested in our continuing development in our relationship with him to draw us nearer to us. And anything that is interfering in our ability to draw closer to the Lord, the Lord is going to oppose. Amen? He's against anything in your life that is going to keep you from drawing closer to him than, than you are today. And, and so here he is going to talk to them about a stumbling block that they have got going on in their church. He identifies it now as, as this woman. She calls her, uh, herself Jezebel, and she is a self-proclaimed prophetess. Now, this woman Jezebel, was Jezebel her actual name or was Jezebel now more the spirit of Jezebel? You remember who Jezebel was in the Old Testament. You remember that there was King Ahab and King Ahab was king over the 10 nations, uh, I mean the 10 uh, tribes uh, uh, that had in the divided kingdom. And, and King Ahab had followed after his fathers, which had allowed some of the pagan gods to be worshipped. They, they weren't really stepping up and driving that idolatry out. 
But it says that Ahab provoked the Lord more than all the other kings that had ever gone before him. He married a Sidonian princess. Her father, the king of Sidon, we see that he was a, a priest of Baal. And so she grew up underneath Baal worship. When King Ahab marries her political uh, connection now, the, the nations sit next to each other. There, there is a, a strength through that marriage, but she's a Baal worshiper and she brings her Baal worship into Israel. And because he is her husband, he builds a temple to Baal in Israel. And then he helps to carve the altar the, for Baal. And through Jezebel now, Baal worship is introduced. And we see that it proliferates throughout the kingdom. And so Jezebel now leads the people away from God, through the, from the true and the living God, into the worship of false gods. Here she has influence within the church in Thyatira, this this woman, she, this self-proclaimed prophetess. She's not a true prophetess, but she is claiming that title. What does that mean? It means that she is telling people that she's got revelation from God. She's got revelation knowledge. God is communicating to her directly. And she is now giving this revelation to the church. And the church is listening to her authority. They're not testing the things that she's saying against the word of God. She's got revelation knowledge. And so they have exalted her voice above the scriptures. And now what is she leading them into? Not into integrity of the scriptures, but she is leading them in direct contradiction. She is leading them now into, and it says, to seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. What does that mean? Well, one of the key issues that was going on in Thyatira, remember that it is a, a workman's place and they had all of these unions, all of these guilds. Each of the unions, each of the guilds had their own God. It was the God of that guild. And so every week they would have their love feasts now in, in order to bring good fortune to their trade, to their craft and to their industry. And so as Christians, you were were expected, to, if you were a craftsman, to be a part of the guild. If you tried to make a living as a craftsman and not be a part of the union, you would not be successful. And so there was this, this need to come and to be a part of this if you wanted to prosper financially. But what about the contradiction of my faith? And this prophetess was now declaring revelation from God that it's all right. If you're a craftsman, you can go to these love feasts. And so you put a pinch of incense. And so you, you eat from some of the meat that they sacrifice. And if there's some sexual revelry going on, as long as your heart really isn't in it, God sees your heart and your actions don't really matter. And God wants you to be successful, right? He wants you to be able to provide for your family. And, and so it doesn't really matter matter. Straight from God. <laughs> and the people were like, all right, this, this solves my problem now and, uh, and no problem whatsoever. And, uh, and so this spiritual idolatry and adultery enters into the church underneath this listening to this voice of Jezebel. And, uh, and so we see here that uh, that sexual uh, immorality uh, is serious because uh, outside of marriage, we see that it, there is always the, the consequence and the relationship uh, uh, that it is affecting. We see that God tells us that we are to worship him and him alone. And when we start bowing down and worshiping anything else in our life, now, Here's the issue. They didn't stop becoming Jews or Christians. They didn't stop coming to service and, and worshiping. They were adding it to their identity, not changing their identity. So with the rationalization from the prophetess, it was just an add-on. But here we see that 
that that was completely unacceptable before the Lord. Now, part of the spiritual idolatry that was taking place goes back also to when Jezebel introduces the Baal worship. With Baal, they would have these little images of Baal. They would be these carved images, these carved statues. And what the people would do is they would buy those statues and then bring them home and put them into their house. And they would then start to pray to Baal whenever they got sick. It's like you pray to God, but then also Baal's there as you're walking by the hall and you're like, hey, Baal, can you help me out? I'm not feeling good. And, and so kind of like that insurance, it's that superstition, it's that trusting in addition to God, you're also trusting in these other things. It's, it's like having a, 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 a rabbit's foot for good luck. <laughs> I always wondered about that. A rabbit's foot for good luck. That didn't make sense to me. That foot certainly wasn't lucky for the rabbit uh, that, uh, that it was uh, on and, and carrying that around. So, so they were all of these icons uh, that started to show up in the people's uh, houses that took their devotion away from God and started to put it on to these icons. Well, this church uh, here, Thyatira, in church history represents the time of the corrupt church from the time of 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. And this was the time period in church history where statues started to show up in churches. This is where statues of Jesus started to show up and statues of Mary started to show up and statues of saints started to show up and people started to pray to these statues, started to pray to Mary, started to pray to the saints. And, and we see now that these idols that, that Jezebel had introduced uh, into the, the nation of Israel, we see that these carved images start to show up within the church during this period as well. God had told the nation of Israel, you are not to make any graven image of me or of the things of heaven or the things uh, on earth. And prior to this period, there weren't graven images that were within the church. But it was during this period now in church history where all of these things start to enter into the church. And, and so, they are now not stopping praying to God, but they're praying to God and uh, to these other things, influences uh, in their life uh, as well. And the Lord says in verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. The Lord likens it to a married man who's trying to date women while he's remaining married. He still identifies as married, but in addition to that relationship, it is no longer just that relationship. There is also romantic interest outside of the bonds of the marriage fidelity. That is the adultery. And so the Lord says, look, you need to stop. And I'm giving you time. You figure out that this is an exclusive relationship it's all me or you can go wherever you want. You can do whatever you want. But you can't have me and others. I will not have a divided heart. I will not be in a relationship with you like that. And I gave you time to figure it out. I called John and I gave you time to repent. And it says, and she did not repent. And so now we see that that the grace of God has run its course. And now it is in time for consequence. There is a time for action. He says, indeed, verse 22, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Once again, what does God want? God wants our heart. And so he says, unless you repent, but if you repent, what? Restoration, we keep on going and, uh, and continue to grow in our relationship together. He says, and I will kill her children with death. It's like, what? Just remember that, that death means separation. And her children aren't her physical children. It means anybody who's going to follow in that practice. And so what does he say? Death means separation. He says, if you continue 
in the direction that you're going, then I will stop being involved in your life. And he says, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. And, and so he says, stop the adulterous relationship. He says, know that I'm the one that searches the minds and the heart. He says, give me your cell phone right now. I want to read your text messages. <laughs> I want to see what you're doing. <laughs> I know the websites you've been on. I see the text messages that you've been sending. Stop. Stop. I know the mind and the heart. I search it. I can see it. It's open to me. You might think that it's hidden. Nobody else can see it. Nobody else sees. God sees. And it's about our relationship with him. And he says, and I know your hearts. He gives us a time to repent. And if we will not repent, if we will not change our way, then most assuredly he will come with eyes of flame and feet of brass and he will come as the son of God and he will judge us. And so he says, I will give to each one of you according to your works. Know this, that God's desire is to reward us and to bless us, but also there are consequences to sin as well. So according to the decisions we're making, we're going to be blessed or judged. And it's not just judgment, and it's not just blessing. That he hates evil, and he loves righteousness, and evil hurts our relationship with him. And that's why he's serious about driving out evil in our lives. Now, I say, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. So he's talking to the remnant, those that are not being influenced by Jezebel, those that are not compromising their faith, those that are refusing to go into the guilds and, and to go to the love feasts and all, and, and they're suffering the persecution because of it. He says, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. The depths of Satan is this false doctrine that she's preaching that says that you can compromise with the world and still love God. He says, I'll not put on you any other burden. And, uh, and so Jezebel was, you know, she's declaring to them this progressive revelation, this deeper insight into the, the, the scriptures. I always get nervous anytime I hear somebody say that there's, there's this new doctrine in the scriptures. There's this new truth, this progressive revelation that we have of God. Because uh, I am of the old adage that if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and so when, when you see these sudden shifts and, and it's coming through a person's experience with God, I get very nervous. We want to test all things against the scriptures to see if these things are true or not. Now, remember, this is being written to the corrupt church. And uh, and the church in this time period from the time of 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., it, it underwent some incredible corruption within the church, if you will look at that period of time. Everything from, uh, from the bribery that was going on within the church, the office of the pope was actually auctioned off to the highest bidder. You could buy the office uh, of the pope, and it was sold. The office of the pope was actually uh, sold as well. Uh, but also the, the, the incredible corruption of indulgences uh, was during this period as well. Now, indulgences were tied to purgatory. Purgatory was the doctrine that the church held, that there is an intermediate state between this life and heaven. That while you die in faith and your sins are forgiven you, your soul needs to be cleansed of all the stains that it got. You're forgiven, but your soul needs to be cleansed so that when you stand before God now, you can be welcomed into heaven because you are fully cleansed now of all your sins. So you go to this waiting place of purgatory where your sins are, are cleansed from you. Now, depending on how many sins you committed in your life, that's the amount of time that you're going to need to spend in purgatory. But... If you would make a generous donation to the church, 
we can shorten the length of time that you are going to spend in purgatory. So you could prepay your time in purgatory right now with a generous contribution. Now, not only could you do that for yourself, but if you love your wife and you don't want to leave her in purgatory, uh, you can also make a donation for her. We can get her out early. If you have loved ones, your children, we can prepay for them as well. If you have dead relatives, your parents, if you love your mom and you want to get her out of purgatory, you can make a donation there as well. We can shorten her time in purgatory. And and this was the practice of the church now of paying for what were known as indulgences, corrupt wickedly corrupt. And and it was at the time that they were building the Vatican and the Basilica of St. Peter and painting the Sistine Chapel with Michelangelo and and they were needing the money to be able to fund this building project that they were undergoing and and this was the, the corruption that took place during that time period. And and so uh, we see here that, uh, that this now was this time period uh, where the church was selling these indulgences. He says in verse 25, but hold fast uh, what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels as I also have received uh, from my father. And so here we see that he's talking about the the second coming of uh, Jesus Christ and that when he returns, he's going to rule and reign in righteousness and we're going to rule and reign in righteousness uh, with uh, him as well. Now, that period uh, that we just talked about of corruption and indulgences, that's actually, just a footnote, that's what got Martin Luther excommunicated from the Catholic Church. You may know Martin Luther is, is the one that wrote the 95 treatises that was nailed onto the church in Wittenberg. And, and those treatises were the corruptions in the church that he had seen and was writing this letter. But the issue that gets him excommunicated from the church was his stance uh, on now indulgences. And, and the church justified indulgences because they said that what they had was uh, they, they had the storehouse, the bank of all of the good works that all of the saints had done prior to are all in this bank. And that what they are doing is they're receiving money and they're taking out of the bank these good works and applying them to your life. And those good works are what reduced your time in purgatory. And Luther said, because he didn't believe that to begin with, he says, but if that is true, and the church really has this bank of good works that can get people out of purgatory quicker, then you should open up that bank and get everybody out of purgatory for free uh, and not charge people. And they said, you're excommunicated. (laughs) In the second coming of Jesus Christ, we as the saints are going to come with him. It says that we're going to be given power. Remember how the disciples are sent out two by two? And when he sends them out, they're given power when they go out over unclean spirits and also uh, over sickness. And and so when we rule and reign with Christ, we also are going to be imbued with with power to be able to serve alongside of the Lord. He says in verse 28, and I will give him the morning star and he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And once again, the, the familiar refrain, if you have ears to hear, then hear what the Spirit says. God doesn't shout. He whispers. And you have to be willing to still yourself down and be willing to hear the things that that God is saying. As we close our study right here, that was was really what was on my heart is where it says, he who has an ear. Do we have an ear to hear? Lord, what are you saying? As we look at these seven letters, Lord, what are you trying to communicate to us? And what are you trying to communicate today? And as I look at those four churches and Yes, they're typologies, and yes, they, uh, they do identify periods of, of church history, but I also saw them as a stage of spiritual development, that, that each one of these are, are common to all of us with, 
within our stage of spiritual maturity. And that in each stage of spiritual maturity that we go through in, in our life, there are dangers and pitfalls that we need to avoid as we move from, uh, from stage to stage as we develop spiritually in our life. And in Ephesus, that was the, the first church, first letter. And that's representative of new believers when you first come to the Lord. And, and what did they have? Man, they had zeal. They, they had tremendous zeal. They had zeal without knowledge, but they had zeal. <laughs> and I remember how much zeal I had when I first got saved. I mean, it was just unbelievable to read the Word of God and know God speaking to me. And this was fantastic in my life. And, and I just couldn't get enough of the Word of God. And, but I was zeal without knowledge. And, and what was the danger of that? Remember that they're criticized as the loveless church, okay? And, and here's what I see happening in new believers' lives and also in my own life. As the Lord started to show me in my life sin that he wanted gone in my life, and as I started to respond to that, right, I started to look around and say, hey, everybody, you shouldn't be doing that either, <laughs> And what I thought was that as God showed this to me, that I became the, uh, the self-appointed Holy Spirit for everybody else uh, that, that was around me. And, and when I got a personal conviction, I was quick to let you know that you should be convicted by my personal convictions as, as well. And, and that was that zeal without knowledge that when you start to, to be somebody else's Holy Spirit, there's no love involved uh, uh, there now. Because most certainly that is a, a trap that w we need to work through. And then we start to grow with, with the knowledge that I'm not actually anybody else's Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, and that kind of moves out of our life. And we can get back to loving people instead of judging people and being their Holy Spirit. And that's, that, that's the challenge of being that new believer that, that needs to be balanced. That was the word that the Lord gave to, to Ephesus. Get back to loving. Get back to loving. You've kind of strayed away from that. The next phase of spiritual development that I see uh, in people's lives, in my own life, is, is after you move past that, you begin to struggle with hurts and difficulties and persecutions. There is somehow uh, just an innate understanding in our life that now that I'm going to church, that now that I'm praying, that now that I'm doing things right, now that I'm not doing the things that I'm not supposed to be doing uh, anymore, or at least doing less uh, of them, that, that my life is supposed to get easy and God is going to protect me from trials and tribulations and, and hardships. And oftentimes those trials and tribulations and hardships even can come from other Christians and that is so hurtful when how could another Christian do that mm, to me? And, and the enemy is quick to tell you they're all a bunch of hypocrites. And, and when you go through a difficulty or a hardship, God didn't really protect you. And this isn't really real. And you're like, wow, God, I thought that you were going to protect me and you didn't. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and you didn't have my back. And, and they fall away. It's easy to identify them. They're, they're the people that when you try and talk to them about Christianity or Christ or your faith, they say, oh, I already tried that and it didn't work for me. Underneath that it didn't work for me was a hurt. They got hurt that they thought that God was going to keep them from, that, that, that they weren't supposed to have to experience that and it didn't work for me. That time of persecution, the time of hardship, the time of tribulation, we, we see that Jesus tells us that we are going to ha have it. And to that church, what did, what did he say? Just hold on to your faith. Just hold on to your faith. Just keep on going. And that's where some Christians fall away is, is when they get hurt. And after we make it through there and come to recognize that, <laughs> that Christianity isn't going to give us less problems, it's actually going to give us more problems, thank you. <laughs> That's what I needed. That's what I signed up for. More problems in my life. 
And I keep going to church and I'm growing and I'm studying and, and I'm living the life and I'm living the walk and I'm maturing as, as a Christian. And, and then the next thing that, that we need to be careful of in the next season in our life is compromise. Compromise. The enemy starts to say, aren't you tired of this? Isn't this like, aren't you overdoing it a little bit? Can we just slow down a little bit? Do you have to read your Bible all the time? Do you have to always go to church? And, and, and suddenly now the, the, the enemy tries to come to you to get you to compromise the standards of what you're living in your life. Kind of like when you're on a diet for a long time. And you go buy a donut shop. And it's like, you know what? Look, you've been doing so good. You deserve a cheat day. <laughs> Everybody needs a cheat day in their diet. And there's nothing wrong with a cheat day. You're doing most of the things right uh, all of the time. And, uh, and so uh, a cheat day mentality. And, uh, and the enemy comes and says, come on, you party pooper. Let's live a little bit uh, here. You deserve a cheat day. Day, you know, and, and, and that's the voice of compromise that comes in. And that compromise is the crack that happens. It's the crack. And leaven comes in through the crack. We go, oh, but it's only just a little bit. It's only a little, kind of a little crack. No one's perfect. Come on. <laughs> ah. When you start to, to be comfortable with leaven, that's compromise. And the Bible says that a little bit of leaven does what? Spreads throughout the entire life. And so that, that compromise, just that little bit, just that, that start now leads to a continuation, to a spread, and to ultimately now it leads to the the church of Thyatira, which is now corruption. And you say, how did, how did I get here? How did this happen? There is an awareness of how far I have drifted and come, how, how deep the corruption is in my life. See, it's not corruption like, I'm going to take a bribe to do somebody a favor. That's a corrupt official. And it's like, I would never be dishonest like that. I would never be corrupt like that. The difference between compromise and corruption. Compromise means there's a crack, but there's still the integrity of the system in place. When someone says we've had a, a compromise in, in our security, it means that the security is still in operation, but there was a crack. There was a breach. And we need to go figure that out and to seal that up so, so that system continues to operate. That's a compromise. There's a compromise, but the integrity is still there, and we need to get to, to the breach. Corrupt is different. When you're working with the data set and your data set is corrupt, you have to throw the whole data set out. It's like, this is no good. We can't, we can't use it. It's, it's corrupted. The integrity has been compromised to the degree that it's no longer usable. When you have a hard drive and a failing hard drive, it's corrupt. Your hard drive is corrupted. It means that it's not a glitch anymore. It's not working anymore. The integrity of the structure has failed. It's corrupted. In terms of our relationship with God, the the compromise is the breach, but the corruption means that now the relationship is failing. The integrity of the relationship is in fail. And it starts with that in compromise. And we see that, that the Lord says, just repent. Just recognize uh, where you are. Where did it begin? It began when you became comfortable with compromise. When you became comfortable with leaven in your life and return back to that point in your life and seal the breach and repent before the Lord and let's keep on going. God is interested and concerned in every single one of us standing before us, before him and hearing those words, well done, 
Thy good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom, receive your reward. Whether you're a new believer or whether you are at whatever point in your spiritual maturity, every issue has challenges. Paul would tell us to finish the race, run it to win, and finish strong all the way to the end. And whether you're just starting out or whether you are nearing the finish line, we see that these letters have great insights to help us in whatever season that we are in, in our spiritual journey in our lives. God is for you. God desires to wash you, cleanse you, restore you, fill you afresh, strengthen you, and enable us to continue to live the victorious Christian life if we have ears to hear what the Spirit is willing to speak. Speak loudly, Lord, and may we listen and respond to your truth today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, we ask that you would just bless us, fill us afresh this morning, Lord. We ask that you would just deepen our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've never